1 John chapter 2, and we'll be doing uh, chapter 2, we'll be doing the rest of the chapter, at least down to verse 27. So chapter 2, verse six, uh, 15 to 27. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out that it might become plain that all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, life eternal. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing, that you received from him abides in you. And you have no need anyone should teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and it is true and is not a lie, just as taught you, abide in him. That is, abide in Christ. When Jesus was talking to Israel, <clears throat> And it became very clear that when he shared with them that he was the son of God and he made himself equal to his father in, a, in his divinity, that they were not interested as a whole, especially the leaders. Then Jesus said to them, if someone else were to come in his own name, I come in the name of my father, but if someone were to come in his own name, you would believe him. And as you follow the scriptures, you will see that if you carry it forward with what Paul says and what John says in the book of Revelation, that is predicted. That Israel would rather, for some reason, in the end, follow someone who comes in their own name, not in the name of the Father. What Jesus offers is a kingdom not of this world, and therefore, if what you want is the world, he would be the wrong king for you. If your hope is that Jesus gives you the world, then you're going to be quite disappointed on the day you see him hanging on the cross and thinking, this one clearly is not going to give us the world. But rather he's denied himself and he's been taken from this world. His kingdom is of a different kingdom. The world is very attractive. It says, do not love the world or the things in the world. Words by themselves are idiot things. They don't mean anything unless they have a context. The same word love and the same word world is in John 3.16, for God so loved the world. It's the same word for world, same word for love. But here, love and world are being used a little differently. Do not love the world or the things or desires in the world, the things in the world. 
And he gives his reason. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The fundamentally, what uh, God is doing here is pointing out that to follow Jesus is a commitment not to be an idolater. Paul gives a whole bunch of uh, the list of sins that we are to walk away from, and one is greed, which he says, which is idolatry. Greed is idolatry. Jesus was of such a, a ministry, and what he was doing was he wasn't making himself wealthy. He wasn't making anyone else wealthy. He wasn't offering the wealth of the world to anyone. Rather, he said that people had to pick up their cross, deny themselves, follow him. But covetousness, which is idolatry, according to the scriptures from beginning to end, it is so much of what the world is about. And we're not to love the world with covetous eyes. We're not to love the world with the desire of things the things that make life worth living for many. It says here that for all that is in the world, now there's good things in the world, there's babies, there's moms, there's grandparents, there's lots of good things. That's not what he's talking about. But what he is saying though, that fundamentally, men live by sight. And they value what they can see and what they can touch and what they can taste. And they tend to not value the Heavenly Father whom they cannot see, whom they cannot taste, cannot touch. My students at the college just did a massive final exam. And they had to do a two-hour exam on how does the first book, especially Genesis, including Exodus, but especially Genesis, how does, how does the book point out that people are to live by faith and not with confidence in the flesh? By faith and not confidence in the flesh. And what the, the book of Genesis does very clearly, it points out that you're safe when you live by what you hear. But when you view life by what you see, what you taste, what you touch, what you can feel, though that seems so real, story after story after story in the book of Genesis make it very clear that you will go in a wrong direction. That faith comes from hearing the word of God. It comes from hearing. It comes from reading what God has written. It comes from hearing what he has said. It comes from God speaking to you through others, through prayer, through Bible reading. But it's from hearing the voice of God. But God makes it very clear in his word that if we love the world, we won't hear him. We're spending too much time tasting, feeling, touching, and seeing. And we won't hear him. We won't hear his voice. The Bible says the Pharisees loved money. And they did not hear the voice of God in John's ministry, John the Baptist. John preached, and he called them to wail, to confess their sins, and to repent. But they didn't recognize God's voice in John. And then Jesus came and he called the nation to dance. He called the nation to, to experience forgiveness and life and freedom and healing and people being raised from the dead. It was a chance to rejoice for the kingdom of heaven was here. And the Pharisees were too busy 
too busy with the pride of life and with things they could touch and handle and they loved money that they could not hear the voice of God in Jesus either. And Jesus pointed out to them that the wisdom of the children is proven right. Little kids know when to, to cry, when sad songs are said. And little kids know when to dance. You play a tune with a dance and my little grandchildren will dance all over the place. And Jesus says, God gave you a chance to have a dirge, to hear God's voice. He wanted you to confess your sins and you would not, you would not embrace and hear the dirge and you wouldn't mourn for your sins. And then I send my son after John and he calls you to dance, but you don't dance because you don't hear his voice. The love of the Father is not in you. The word of God is not in you. You cannot recognize John. You cannot recognize Jesus and the voice of God behind each of them because you're too busy being covetous and loving the world, loving the praise of the world, loving the praise of men, loving the status of how people see you. He calls it the pride of life, the desire of the eyes, and the desire of the flesh. God says, if you spend all your time looking to be, comfort, uh, to be comfortable, you will not hear the word of God. If you're always looking for the new news about what the world's offering to stay current, you will not hear the voice of God and the love of God of the Father will not be in you. This world is passing away. Eventually, the universe won't care who's the best football team or hockey team or soccer team. They will not care. The, the universe will not care what is the prettiest city on the planet because this world is passing away with its desires. The universe won't care who's got the largest ranch in North America. Who's got the biggest, most powerful company in the world? The universe won't care because it will all pass away. John warns that if we love the world, we are vulnerable to the foolishness that's gonna come on the whole world. He says, children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, there is an Antichrist called the man of sin, called the man of lawlessness, called the beast, called the little horn, called the horn, called the great horn. He's given many titles, but he's coming, John says. And he's gonna give the world what it wants. And those who are greedy and covetous and all those kinds of things, they're gonna like him. He's gonna be like the perfect prosperity gospel guy you could find. So now many, so now many antichrists have come. There are already many in the first century, in the first century, people that were going out and making it very clear to young believers not to believe in Jesus. And their best weapon was they were offering something that would allow you to call yourself a Christian and still have this love for the world and be covetous to the core. The Bible says when the Antichrist comes, he will speak big words and he will be covetous and he will have the eyes of man. He will reflect these three qualities that are so much part of the world and so will his followers. Therefore, we know that is the last hour. In the Bible, there are 12 hours in a day. 12 hours. When Jesus met people at the 10th hour, that meant there was only one-sixth of the day left. John describes where the world's at in the first century as we're in the 12th hour. We're in the 12th hour. Now, he's not th thinking in, in sense of just pure time. He's thinking of the intensity of the battle that is to come. He says, we're in that time when God now has finally revealed who Jesus is. 
And Satan has brought his plan forward, which is to replace Jesus or to deny Jesus, or to deny Jesus by changing who Jesus really was. It says they went out from us, a whole bunch of these people, no, no doubt, a lot of them Jewish people, and they went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been with us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so they might be made plain that they were not of us. They had, there were people that were in the church, but they didn't believe, for example, that Jesus was the Son of God. They didn't believe that Jesus actually died for people's sins. Many of them didn't believe that Jesus was fully human. They had all their theories who Jesus was. But in the end, they were not truly of us. They never embraced the doctrines of the apostles. They liked much of what the church was, but they knew that they needed to change its teaching. And eventually what happened is the church got tired of them and they got tired of the church and huge masses of people by the end of the first century started leaving in mass because they, they knew better in their minds. They had a greater truth of who Jesus was. They were not gonna depend on the old apostles. There were so few of them left like John to fight them. They were gonna get a new Jesus one that the world would embrace. I saw a, uh, a thing on TV, no, it was on YouTube, Sharon showed it to me, it was excellent. And this lady was railing this Christian pastor in the market square, and he gave a wonderful reply. Gracious, kind, thought out, and all he did was point out the greatness of Jesus Christ. And I thought, good on you, pastor. Because she wanted Jesus to be in her back pocket to support all her evil plans and things. And he just wouldn't allow it. He just went back to the historical Jesus and made it very clear that there is no salvation apart from faith in Jesus. Jesus is more than just a good moral philosopher. Someone that you can get your new love your world plan backed by what we have here is these guys decided that the historical Jesus as was preached by the apostles was not acceptable and so they left and John says they never were part of you but you have been anointed by the Holy One and you have knowledge or all of you know I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is from the truth. The devil has been a liar from the beginning. He was a liar through the serpent in the garden. Cain was a liar when he suggested that he didn't know what happened to his brother. The devil has been a liar and a killer and a fraud and a denier of God's truth right from the beginning. And the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist that is in the world, it's, it, it's been in the world since the first century. It will continue in the, in the world until, right till the end, until the Antichrist, the ultimate Antichrist comes and he will actually himself claim to be the Christ. I write to you not because you do not know the truth but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Messiah? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. The Muslims speak highly of Jesus. They believe he was born of a virgin. The Muslims believe he was sinless. It's in the Quran. Both those statements are in the Quran. But they do not believe he is the Son of God. And they do not believe he was crucified on a tree. And they do not believe he was raised three days later. So do they believe in Jesus? Yes, they do. Do they believe in Jesus? Not at all. Because their Jesus is not the Jesus that was preached by the apostles. It is not the Jesus that the apostles knew. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Messiah? 
This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. So many would like us to believe that there is only one God, therefore all the religions must eventually be accepted by this one God. But the apostles say very clearly, God has revealed himself in the person of his Son. And anyone who denies his Son the Father makes it very clear, I will have nothing to do with you. Nothing to do with you. I get that as a dad. If someone came to me and said, I hate your son, Joshua. Can we have fellowship? <laughs> right. I'm going to be eager to have a lunch with you. Okay. Or you say things about Joshua, I don't know, just aren't true. It's not who he is. I'm not interested in praise about concerning my son if it's not true. I want my son to be praised for who he really is. And God wants his son to be praised for who his son really is. And he wants to be praised for what he did through his son and for his son. And will not have anyone snatch this glory from him, that his son was sinless, that his son paid the price for everyone in this room. You see, this group that left did not believe that you need your sins forgiven. In fact, they didn't even believe they had sin. God says, you really think Jesus died on a tree because you were bored? Because you needed something to do? He died because there was no other way for me to forgive you and look like I'm soft on sin and I am not soft on sin. He who denies the Son, the Father will deny him. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. It's amazing. People speak well of my wife, my children, my grandchildren, my daughter-in-laws, and I know they're brilliant. <laughs> and I like them. <laughs> and I like them a lot. You want to get in the good books of the Heavenly Father? Get to know His Son and speak well of Him and follow Him and obey Him. And the Father will take note of you. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you've heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you too will abide in the Son and the Father. Don't walk away. Don't add to the teaching you were given. Don't come up with any newfangled idea that this will make the gospel more attractive to the world. It is such a... Uh, a, a temptation to want to have somehow the world embrace Jesus without it actually repenting of its sins and its waywardness. But God says, don't do that. Hold on as you were taught. Don't give this up. Stay true. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and the Father. That's a threat. He's saying... He, You've got to hold to the Jesus that the Bible actually talks about, not the one that people would like to create. The name itself, Jesus, has no power if what you believe about that name is inconsistent with who he is. When we talk about a person's name, we're talking about the reputation, but it's based on a reality. And so he says, hold on to how you were taught concerning who Jesus was. And this is the promise that the Father promised us, which is the theme of the entire letter, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. If you go to the Regina University, as I've said before, you've got the entire wall, as big as this church wall, full of books that would encourage you not to believe in Jesus. Big time. 
spirit of Antichrist is alive and well in Saskatchewan. We need to pray that our children do not buy into it. We need to pray for our grandchildren, pray for our own heart. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you, lead you astray. But the anointing that you receive from him, the Holy Spirit was given to each and every one of us so that we would not be at a tremendous disadvantage where the world has all of its power and attraction and desires and its demonic forces and the spirit of Antichrist and the devil himself fighting us and we'd be by ourselves in our own wits. It would be a totally unfair fight. But God has anointed us with the spirit of Jesus. He has placed his spirit upon us. And if we'll walk by that spirit, we just know that what the scripture says is true. God has anointed us. But the anointing you receive from him, it abides in you. And you have no need that anyone should teach you. Now John's writing a letter to teach these people. What he's talking about is not that you sometimes don't need to be reminded and informed. But the cults often come across like without what they bring, you don't have a chance of finding the truth. And so this is the first of five books with the Mormon church. But the next four books undo this book completely. By the time you get to the fifth book, this book is completely irrelevant. And yet, hundreds of millions of people call themselves Christians that hold to books that make this book without authority. That you, this is not enough. It's just not enough. It is the spirit of Antichrist. And you find out that, that the Jesus of this book is so different from the Jesus of the second, third, fourth, and especially the fourth and fifth books. I'm not here to be mean-spirited. I'm not trying to pick a fight. But if you're gonna call yourself a Christian, you have to hold as Jesus was taught by the uh, apostles. And John was one of the few surviving apostles as the first century came to a close. And as he writes this letter, and he recognizes so many are starting to think they can change and, and manipulate and bring a gospel that would be more attractive a more worldly gospel, a more earthly gospel, a more worldly approach. John says, no, don't go there. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you. And you have no need that anyone teach you. If you have the spirit of Christ, you know in your spirit, if you walk by the spirit, choose not to love the world or the things of this world. That the scriptures is very clear who Jesus is. But as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is not a lie, just as it has taught you, abide in Christ. God has given us his spirit and his spirit does not lead us towards loving the world for all that it offers, but it leads us to a, have a deep appreciation for the historical Jesus and what he did. The Holy Spirit prevents us from being put in a terrible situation where we would not know with absolute certainty that what we believe is true, is true. It is funny, there's a lot of scholars with PhDs who study the Bible and they're atheists. They're atheists. You see, your education alone will not give you the certainty of is this book true? Not even 20 years of studying and hundreds of thousands of dollars 
What gives you the confidence that this book is true, that the gospel is true, that Jesus is true, is God gives you his spirit and abides in you. And you just know that you know that you know by the spirit of God that Jesus is exactly who he said he was. And you don't need any guru to help you with that. The Spirit alone has the role to take those things that he has revealed in Scripture and apply them to your heart. How do we know if we actually are believing these things the way we ought? One way, John says, is if you truly understand the unction or the anointing of the Holy Spirit in your life, you lose the love for the world that the Antichrist and the spirit of Antichrist is throwing in your face all the time. When God gives us his spirit, he says, it is about hearing. Faith comes from hearing. It's not so much about seeing. It's not so much about tasting. It's not so much about touching. It's about hearing. And God, we hear his spirit testify with our spirit through reading his word. We hear the gospel. When young people lose confidence in the gospel, they will often give a thousand reasons. When older people lose confidence in the gospel, they often give a thousand reasons. The Bible doesn't give that many. One that the Bible gives is this. You will stay true. You will stay true if you value the anointing God has given you. The Spirit of Christ. Live by the Spirit of Christ. Walk by the Spirit of Christ. Drink of His Spirit. May it quench your thirst so that the, all the things of the world that seem so attractive they're not quite so appealing because the love of the Father is in you and you know this world's passing away. But he who abides in the Father will live forever. Amen? Amen. Amen. When I was a boy, the elders of my church did not believe in Jesus. When I came to know Jesus, and I will ask my elders of my church to help me grow in my faith, only one of all the elders of my church actually made a claim that they knew Jesus. The more I talked to them, it was very clear they didn't know Jesus. Because when I came to know Jesus, it was obvious they didn't know Jesus. Not just by their words, but by their actions and by their fear of someone who came to know Jesus, just freaked them right out. What we need in our lives is not titles. We need the unction of the Holy Spirit to give us the confidence. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you will not have that ultimate power to stay true to the end. But we have the Spirit, and you all know the truth. So walk in that Spirit, and do not let those who would try and deceive you be successful. One of my students said, Mr. Armstrong, you're pretty rough, you're pretty hard on us. And I said, yes. I said, if you have to learn this much to keep yourself from being deceived, you have to learn this much to help others. I says, you have to decide why, you're, why are you here in my class? Save your own skin? You have to learn this much. Help other people not be deceived? You've got to learn this much. But, but in our own lives, our confidence isn't so much how much we know, but it's the fact that we have the spirit of God. Amen. Have a great day. <clears throat>